First of all, good afternoon and good evening, uh, and welcome to another uh, Life and Breath Foundation speaker series. Uh, the speaker series is a, a monthly engagement where we bring national speakers in to talk a little bit more about sarcoidosis and how it affects patients, their families, uh, caregivers, um, in their efforts to manage the journey of the disease. My name is Sean Hall. I'm the president and founder of the Life and Breath Foundation. Uh, we started the organization in 1998. Uh, our primary goals are to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track their journey, decipher medical issues, and maximize their quality of life. Also to, to provide a nurturing environment for those affected by sarcoidosis to share their experiences so that we can build more awareness within the medical community to help combat this chronic disease. Um, it's been my pleasure to be able to do that. And also tonight is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Lamus, who's a, uh, an internist, internal, metal, internal medicine uh, physician with the Greater Baltimore Medical Center in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lamus. Oh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I've been associated with life and breath for something greater than eight years. I, I've taken care of hundreds of people with sarcoidosis. And my, my practice specifics are is I take care of complex patients with have, that have multiple medical problems. I'm here to answer your questions so that if you guys think of additional questions as we go through this, I'll be more than glad to try to answer them for you. Sean, tee up the first question and we'll get going. So if I could like to start with the first question uh, that was uh, sent in for us. Um, so Dr. Lamus, are there any cases where people were able to reverse the illness? Okay. I, I, you know, the, I guess the problem is gonna be with the word reverse. If people, clearly people get sarcoidosis and have a complete remission. So in that setting, I guess we would call that a reversal. Reverse suggests that there's something that we do intrinsically that we caused, that caused the disease to go into complete remission. It will be really hard to, to say that that would occur since more than 50% of the people who get sarcoidosis get a complete remission with us doing nothing. Another, call it 25, 30% of people require the use of steroids or other drugs, and they will develop indeed a complete remission for a prolonged period. I mean, it's hard to say because some people develop, even after years of being in remission, can have the disease uh, become evident again and then require retreatment or additional uh, efforts to keep it under control. So I, I think I answered it, but reversal, I'm not sure we should use that word. Can, does it go into remission? The answer is yes. For, for a large number of people, some require medicines, some can do it uh, without any medication at all. So I think that's it. So Dr. Lamus, maybe let's, let's say, let's identify what is sarcoidosis and you know, what are the organs that are generally affected? Could you, okay. could you opine on that sure. and share a little bit? Sure. What is sarcoidosis? It's a generally thought to be an autoimmune disorder characterized by the formation of unusual groups of cells commonly involving the lungs as, a, as probably the most affected organ system. But literally sarcoidosis has been found to be present in virtually every tissue in the body. So everywhere, most commonly in the lungs. And if we were looking at other organ systems, we would say eye, liver, kidney, skin, uh, that would be the most common places. Are you aware um, what are you aware of the is there a natural treatment 
for sarcoidosis that you're aware of? And if so, what would those be? Um, and then naturally <laughs> on the other side, you know, what often sure. medications are used in the treatment of sarcoidosis? Okay. When I think of the word natural treatment, I think you're asking me whether there could be something nutritional or herbal, homeopathic, uh, something like that, herbal treatments. You know, the problem with that whole statement is going to be, since I told you that 50% of the people get better when we absolutely do nothing and it simply goes away, the rest. I do not believe that there is anything that one can do except excellent supportive care that should be part of everybody's sarcoidosis treatment. It should be good nutrition. It should be things that support one's immune system. Uh, you know, there would be a group of, of practitioners who would say that it's commonly uh, could be affected by a better mindset. I mean, there are mind-body physicians who have participated in uh, sarcoidosis treatment who can give a fairly convincing argument that the use of mind-body uh, and good nutrition will have a positive outcome. I'd have a hard time arguing with that, but does it treat the disease? Uncertain. Does it make the person healthier so that they are capable of manifesting their own fight against the disease? Yes. Okay, most common treatment, hands down, is steroids. Uh, steroids have been the principal form of treatment for, well, probably 35 or 40 years. Steroids at moderate doses to start with are often used in people who develop secondary symptoms, people that have large lung involvement, shortness of breath, et cetera, almost all start out with steroids. And if the dose has to be high because they're not getting anywhere, they often add another immune modulating drug like methotrexate. If, they, if the disease progresses or is found to be in multiple organ systems, it's not uncommon now for one to use a biologic agent Currently, these drugs are almost all the same drugs that we use for rheumatoid arthritis. These are drugs like Remicade, and there are many, many of them. To say any one drug is better than the other has really not been well established, but uh, the drugs that are of the class that are called biologic agents are frequently the drugs that are used for multi-system disease or people who are dramatically sick. They're very excellent drugs. They work very well. They have a scary list of, you know, could be, sort of be, might be, could it be, things happen associated with the drug. But quite honestly, these people that require the use of those drugs are sick enough that clearly the benefit outweighs the risk for the overwhelming number of people. <clears throat> very interesting. So um, how likely is someone with sarcoidosis to get lymphoma? Okay, also hard to answer again, because true, true, unrelated happens in this disease. It's not uncommon for people to be told they have lymphoma when they have an abnormal chest X-ray or they have a constellation of signs and symptoms and I turn around and figure out that it's sarcoid, that happens with some regularity. If you're asking about whether people develop lymphoma due to the treatment associated with biologic agents, I can't give you a great number because the databases haven't been constructed over a long period of time, but the number is quite small. Okay. I mean, we're talking, in, you know, considerably less than 5%. And I think most of us would say it's, you know, in the range of 1% or less. Okay. So, Dr. Lamus, I, um, I know I get, I get emails 
every month uh, from patients that want to know a little bit more about the disease and they're just not sure. They're not getting the direction from their current provider, you know, and those are some people that I've introduced you to and you've been very gracious to be able to communicate and try to help them with things to consider, conversations to have with their medical professional. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those interactions and examples? Because we may have some, some individuals on this call that are in that same category. Would you be sure. able to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Sarcoidosis is a disease that usually doesn't come first thing to any physician's mind. But yet sarcoidosis can present in many, many ways. The most common presentation is someone for an unknown reason or for a totally dissimilar reason, I should have said, gets a chest x-ray. And then there's this telephone call to their doctor that says, your patient has either a mass or has enlargement of what we believe to be lymph nodes on the chest x-ray. And you, got, you need to be doing some searching. And then, with, then after the panic of that telephone call to the, to the patient that said, you have an abnormal chest X-ray with what is suggestive of being either a tumor or other abnormalities that are potentially very serious, uh, they go some, through some diagnostic testing. Frequently, they get a piece of tissue either by doing a bronchoscopy or making a small incision in the upper part of the neck grabbing a piece of tissue, sending it to the laboratory. And then the report comes back. Findings are, are a granuloma, which is that funny bunch of cells that I started out telling you about. And this, the pattern of this abnormality is suggestive of sarcoidosis. Rarely do they turn around and say, oh, this is sarcoidosis because granulomas can be formed by many, many things. They can be everything from tuberculosis, it can be leprosy, it can be beryllium, it can be an autoimmune-like reaction or a allergic reaction to things that you've inhaled. But the report would come back, findings are consistent with sarcoidosis, and then they'll put a whole bunch of other diagnoses. And then it ends up, for the doctor to have to try to dis dissect from that with a good history exam, some additional blood tests to be able to know for certain that to the best we're able to identify at this time, you indeed have sarcoidosis. Then I get this phone call later that says, what do you think? And those are the ones that I have gotten frequently from you, Sean. Or sure. someone goes to their primary and they really don't know, or they live in, Elmont, Colorado, up on the fringe, and they're away from any larger center, and they don't have access to people who have enough experience to try to answer their questions. And as you know, we've had people that have called from Bermuda, people that have called from many places in the world that I've spoken with. And usually I have a similar discussion to what I just said with you, and we go through the other potentials. I go through the this, the other testing that frequently needs to be done to try to identify what's right and what's wrong. And I help them find regionally where an appropriate provider would be to help them get the care they need. Sure, sure. It's, um, thank you for that. I, I thought that was a, a really good response in real life in terms of what we hear sometimes. So you mentioned earlier that 50% of 50% uh, of the time, without doing anything, sarcoidosis goes away. And then we had an earlier question um, centered around remission. Um, the, the the next question comes from an individual that would like to know uh, how can you know if sarcoidosis is in remission or just smoldering. Well, it's a great question. The answer is, is that this, the lymph nodes or the abnormality on the chest x-ray goes away and there are no other symptoms. Frequently, the patient had no symptoms to begin with. They had a chest x-ray, 
that was abnormal and that was the thing that set off this whole cascade of diagnostic tests and evaluations. Smoldering. Smoldering suggests that it would continue to progress. Very rarely does this disease just sit there within large lymph nodes and nothing happens. It happens once in a while, but like I said, 50% of them, their lymph node enlargement for whatever reason will go diminish or go away. Sometimes they're scarring and they don't completely go to normal, but more often than not, the chest X-ray, unless you do things like CAT scans or PET scans, you don't see anything. Can you tell if it's smoldering? Yeah, you can order a test like a PET scan and if there's any inflammatory uh, activity going on, it will light up as will other areas of the lung, et cetera. It's, this disease though should be principally symptom driven. You shouldn't be chasing every speck on a chest CT or a chest X-ray because this is not like cancer. You know, cancer will grow and become an enormous problem, but sarcoidosis, if it sat there and it smoldered and never grew and didn't cause any other abnormalities or any other issues, we don't see a decrease in life lifespan, nor do we see other things happening. Now, the only disclaimers I'm gonna give you to that statement is you better be evaluated well enough to be sure that if someone makes a diagnosis of sarcoid, you've looked at all those other organ systems to be sure you don't have something in your eye that you didn't know about, or you didn't have renal patch, kidney pathology that you did not know about, or that funny little bump on your leg that you didn't know about or didn't pay any attention to was a sarcoid nodule. You get my idea. You better be evaluated well enough so that it's okay. Or just one recently, you know, to bring up another unusual case, person had the worst headaches of their life. Uh, an African-American young woman of 36 years of age had been told she had migraines and headaches and she felt lousy, she was coughing, she thought she had post-COVID and blah, 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 blah. She had CNS sarcoid, okay? And you better just get it, you better have somebody think it through, evaluate it properly and then make the diagnosis. This woman's headaches went right away when she got the right treatment. She didn't have migraines. She didn't have any of that other stuff. She had CNS sarcoid. So I, I'm gonna, the disclaimer is don't take it for granted. Just be, you know, this is not a disease that somebody should uh, willy nilly say, well, 50% of the time it's gonna go away. Don't get checked out. You know, it's, you know, don't worry anymore. You do need to be evaluated properly, hmm. period. If, you, if through the evaluation, if your eyes are normal, your kidneys are normal, you've had a full skin exam, your liver is acceptable, you don't have any other abnormalities, then you watch carefully, but you reevaluate again over the year. And even for a couple of years, I would suggest that you still should be evaluated to be certain that the part that looked like it was getting better in the chest x-ray isn't getting worse in your kidneys. So it requires someone with some experience to be certain that you're getting the right care. So you mentioned that, um, um, Dr. Lamus, um, if you have sarcoid and sarcoidosis in one organ, um, do you need to worry about getting it in other organs? You know, does it spread? I think the best way for me to say is, it can be present in multiple organs. Spread would suggest it started somewhere and then bloomed. But remember, I, I told you this is an autoimmune disorder. So an autoimmune disorder affects all tissues in the body. You know, your, the fluid part of your blood is coming in contact with virtually every organ. So something if your immune system malfunctions and is causing an abnormality like a granuloma, it has the potential to cause it everywhere. Gotcha. Did I answer that? Because I, the word spread is, 
using terminology that we would normally use for oncology. Oh, it started in your lungs and now it went to your bones, your brain, your liver, et cetera. This disease, we don't really know. I mean, I have people that have had it just in their eyes, never any other tissue. I've had people like this young woman I told you about earlier, she had it in her brain. She didn't have it elsewhere. When we evaluated her with a very good evaluation, and again, I'll have to follow up over a period of time, you know, I hope she has it nowhere else, but I have no indication at present that it's anywhere else. So spread, I would be cautious with using that word. Awesome, awesome. So oftentimes sarcoidosis uh, is, is thought of as an autoimmune disease. Um, it's described as an immune defunction disease. Is that the same? Immune defunction. Immune dysfunction. 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 Yeah. Well, I guess the right way to say it is anytime your own immune system decides to attack you, that's certainly dysfunction in my mind. The immune system is thought to protect us. That's why some of those things that I started out with telling you, you can have tuberculosis and have a granuloma for it. It formed the granuloma because it was completely enveloping the tuberculosis organism and isolating it from the rest of the tissues of our body. Someday we might figure out that sarcoidosis, you know, is actually a response to at present an unknown infection that could be viral, bacterial, fungal, something in the environment. It could be something allergic that we're not aware of. And that is a constant discussion among people who take care of this disease. But if I also share with you, it's the same discussion we have with things like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, or, you know, all of these autoimmune like disorders, we all wonder why, why did this person get it? What are the circumstances? We've identified groups of people that are more likely to get the disease and we identify them by either their race or their genetics, where they came from. Are they from Northern European? Are they, uh, are they Ashkenazi and Jews? Are, you know, there are many things that we're trying to learn but the fundamental question, the root cause that says why, no, we just don't have it yet. Mm, okay. Um, so we have a, a, a COVID question for you. Um, so we have an individual that has pulmonary SARC. And uh, the question is, if they get COVID, do you recommend Paxlovid or yes. any other treatment? Yeah, Paxlovid, you are, you, you are considered a high-risk individual, okay? Um, Paxlovid is a great treatment. And the only thing I'm going to share with you is the studies that were used to confirm it from the FDA and say, yes, we should use this. And the CDA was, uh, CDC was very helpful. Paxlovid is a combination of two drugs that are antiviral. It was tested on people who are not vaccinated, but at high risk. So about 2,000 patients is my memory. The people, they split them up into groups. The people who weren't vaccinated, okay, uh, all were non-vaccinated. A portion of them were given Paxlovid and another portion were not. You had 13 or 14 patients that got sick enough, ended up in the hospital, ICU, and one person died. Not a circuit, single person who was given Paxlovid on, in the other arm of that treatment was even hospitalized. It's not a perfect study. It's the best we've got for right now. These were drugs that were antiviral drugs that you know, in, in some ways were second sourced from other disease processes. And I think if you were paying attention to the news lately, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci received Paxlovid when he got COVID. He did better. He took the drug. I'm feeling great. He stopped Paxlovid and he bloomed again. 
Well, why is that? Because Paxlovid bid decreased the titer. Uh, I got I to gotta use the right words. It decreased the circulating viral load so that the inflammatory response was minimized. The, pack, the antibodies that were produced allowed things to heal quickly. Stop the drug, he got symptoms again. He retreated himself with Paxlovid, which is what everyone would suggest who does this for a living. And I wish him well, I, I understand he's done quite well. Is Paxlovid a good drug? Absolutely. If you got SARC and it's in your lungs, you have an autoimmune disorder that caused this or a dysfunction, if we wanna use Sean's term, please consider taking Paclovid. You know, I should have started this whole thing out as remember the statements. I'm not giving any one of you any independent medical care for your particular sarcoidosis. I'm giving you the most knowledge I can give you so that you can have a better, more informed discussion with your physicians. Okay, so, there you um, go. Dr. Lamas, I think that's very important. And we should pause uh, right here to be able to really, really emphasize that this platform and the information that we're sharing is not, is not to direct any type of medical advice at all. It is information that you can use to support what you are what you are going through so that you can have a better communication dialogue with your medical professional that you're engaging. If you don't feel like you're having that with your uh, medical professional, then you should possibly consider um, getting another referral to someone that specializes in sarcoid, um, whether it's, it, it's somebody that has extensive experience in that organ treating that particular situation and everything. And we're happy to be able to supply um, a list of in individuals in your area that you live statewide, county-wise, that maybe can help you appropriately. Uh, but that's a good question. So uh, if we stay on the, um, the COVID situation, there's one question in your opinion, Dr. Lamus, should, uh, should we keep getting boosters every six months for COVID? Well, you know, we've now, uh, it's, it's, I wish it was a simpler question to answer for you. The CDC has been very transparent and that's half the reason why people have found reasons to complain because they seem like they're not concrete in their suggestions. We've now have had at least five different versions of COVID that have been common in America. Over 200 versions of COVID have been identified in the world. The principal vaccines by Modira and Pfizer were against the original COVID, which was not as infectious but was really damaging. People got horribly sick, high frequency of hospital admission and a high frequency of people ending up in the ICU and some dying. The current versions that have been far more common now seem to have had a different path for humans. It looks like they're very infectious, but the numbers of people that are ending up in the hospital and the numbers of people dying are small. And they're principally in the groups of people that have not received any or have not had any booster within six months because there is no study to show that our vaccination rate or our vaccination uh, doing it or being adequately immunized after six to nine months is a substantial benefit. So to answer your question, should you get another booster at six months? Stay tuned to what the CDC says. They're actually been very much on the money. And I think you will see that we will receive a booster that is now better tuned for the newer variants that are more common in America. Just to be sure everyone's aware, 
some of those original variants, the really bad actors that were present when this all started are still circulating in America. It's just that they're not the common ones. Mm. Wow, very interesting. Um, have you seen any evidence that sarcoid is hereditary? A hereditary potential to develop the disease, I can say yes. But from one generation to another, direct familial hereditary involvement is quite rare. But I have had people that more than one family member have gotten COVID. That's why I keep saying to you, I wish I really knew what the root cause of the disease was. Because that, would, that is one of the arguments you would have for someone that says it's in your environment. It's something that you are around. It's some unusual organism that is in common everywhere, you know. But the potential to develop sarcoid is clearly more common in some distributions than other. Clearly, if you're African-American, it's more common. Clearly, if you are from the Scandinavian countries or an Ashkenazian Jew, it's more common. But it's also common in other subgroups. You have these little pockets of people where it's found more frequently. That's why we gotta do more study. That's why things like uh, the ideas that we bounce around in life and breath to try to identify a database so that Maybe we would learn something more specific about folks. Maybe we'll be able to get questionnaires that are better able to identify subsets. With that would be the question that says, if we could do that, would we start screening earlier? Would we do something different? Well, maybe, but I would look at you and say, sarcoidosis is a weird enough drug disease that sometimes it presents I think the right way to say it is you have to be alert. If something, if you don't think about sarcoid, you won't make the diagnosis. It can be something as unusual as just an elevated calcium in your blood work. It can be a, a low grade proteinuria in your, a protein secreted in your urine. It can be a minor change in your renal function. It can be those headaches that don't make sense or they don't act like migraines. You, you know, you need somebody, if, if things don't make sense, ask for help and get a better, ask for a second opinion and get somebody and, and bring up the word sarcoid. Sometimes it only requires that they be, have their mind uh, switch, clicked on to say, geez, could this be sarcoid? And then the guy will get the testing, make the diagnosis, and you'll be on your way to better care. Yeah. So um, you mentioned earlier about, um, are there any kidney tests that you recommend? Uh, one of our guests this evening has sarcoidosis in her lungs and has frequent urination, usually minimized, but you know it's bothersome. Um, is that related possibly to, to mm -hmm. sarcoid or? Well, great question. It could be true, true, unrelated, or it could be due to sarcoid. So how do you do the, the evaluation to see whether sarcoid might be involving your kidney? First thing you got is a urine analysis. It starts with a dipstick, and then it requires a microscopic evaluation to look for the presence of white cells or abnormal cells in the urine. Then you, it requires a 24 hour urine collection to see if you have elevated levels of protein. Remember that dipstick that you dip in measures protein as well. If the cells are abnormal that are seen, they need to be evaluated by a pathologist and somebody needs to put in the line that goes to the pathologist. Patient has sarcoid, do you see cells that could be potentially inflammatory cells associated with sarcoid? It requires a blood test for renal function, which are called creatinine and BUN. And then 
if all of that stuff is still suggesting sarcoid, it might require a test looking for inflammatory change in your kidney, the most common of which is a PET scan. But please, this person that's asked you that question, you don't do all of these tests. You start at the most basic test and you have to work through them. And that's why the person helping you interpret it has got to be thoughtful about how he walks through it. And then if there's some question, that doesn't mean you're gonna treat it differently, but it may mean, okay, now we're gonna make a break. We're gonna repeat all this testing and repeat and do what we need to do in two to three months and be certain that what I've told you is accurate. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So you mentioned test and everything. Um, how often do you recommend uh, pulmonary function tests? Well, then it's, you were again back to the question that says, which organ is involved? And then the question is the degree of involvement. And most people with pulmonary sarcoidosis, you know, end up getting, frequently get a biopsy. The testing suggests that they have it. Then you do some pulmonary function tests looking to see whether the air moves in and out of your lungs normally and whether your, your lungs are stiff or whether they move air normally. And then you use those tests to in some ways understand whether or not any treatment that you might have initiated, if you initiated treatment at all, okay, is effective because if the steroids did clear up the inflammatory infiltrates or reduce the inflammation in your lung. Frequently, the pulmonary function tests normalize or go down in plateau at a lower level and are now your new baseline, which is what you follow. That test had to answer your patient's question or the person who's asking it, you need to have your pulmonary doctor help you make that decision. You might do it more frequently than even once a year, but frequently you might do it every one to two years once you're at a stable straight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's let's stay on that test um, testing question. Is it possible to test the level of active vitamin D in sarcoidosis patients, in a sarcoid patient? And if so, how is that done? Active vitamin D. I think you're asking me, has the level, vitamin D when you absorb it, it comes in a form that's not very active. Sunlight helps you activate it and now it becomes a hormone that is helpful in increasing calcium in your body. The concept of whether vitamin D is integral to the disease is disputed by some, and it's not uh, thought to be an active treatment for people with sarcoid. It is, you will find differences of opinion regarding the role of vitamin D in this disease, because it's hard to know what is the chicken and what's the egg. These granulomas that are there are known to convert uh, non -act, not as active vitamin D to a more active form. Whether that is part of the disease as it progresses is clearly not clear. And if someone is pushing that as, as a treatment or otherwise, I, I think you would be getting that individual's um, opinion rather than what the preponderance of evidence would be. So I'm sure we're staying on the vitamin D situation. And this is a new term for me. Um, so are you familiar with hypercalcemia? Hypercalcemia. So, so yeah, let's, say sure. I, let's say I'm a sarcoidosis patient and, and they have that. The question is, can they sunbathe? And will that impact their sarcoidosis? That's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that one before. 15 minutes 
three or four times a week of sunlight converts the normal amount of vitamin D in a person to the active form, which keeps you with healthy bones, etc. I don't think I ought to be telling anybody to go out and sunbathe because it's not the, a reasonable amount is great. But if you're trying to get overly tanned or you want to lay out under the sun, you're asking to cause yourself other problems. I, I'm not sure that it really makes much of an impact on sarcoidosis per se, but your dermatologist will love you when you come in with your skin lesions and your uh, keratoses and your potential for melanoma and squamous cell cancers and you increase your risk of cataracts and all that other stuff, but I'm not sure that it has a big impact on sarcoidosis and its outcome. Mm -hmm. right. So Dr. Lamas, I have a good question for you. So you have sarcoidosis patients out there and they're doing their best to, uh, to try to manage their journey. And they're using several different things to do that, whether it's a folder, it's Excel, it's any number of things. What would you recommend for somebody to use to track their journey? And I, I'd be interested in those patients out there telling us a little bit more how they track their journey, how they track their moods, you know, when they have swings in their and in, in, in flare ups. We talked about remission. We talked about a lot of that stuff. I'd be interested in your thoughts and I'd be interested in the patients telling us a little bit more about how they track their specific journey. Okay. Patients tend to take one of two routes. They tend to be either passive in the treatment of their disease, where they walk into the doctor's office and says, I have sarcoid, what should I do? What should I do? Well, my answer to you is, you've, the more you know about the disease, the better you're going to be not passive and you're going to be able to uh, get the information you need from your healthcare providers. I know best about the, the way people track very active disease. The people that are, do not want to be passive in their treatment, I have had people do it many ways. What I, I tell them basically, you need to take a folder and when you're going for a visit, you need to plan what you're doing at those visits before you get there. And part of that should ask yourself a group of questions like, am I feeling well? Do I have any new symptomatology? What were my presenting symptoms? Do I have any of those again? If it was shortness of breath, you should be telling the doctor, well, my shortness of breath is the same, better, worse, Etc. You should be using the terms that are associated with your disease. And I would suggest that you walk in with a piece of paper and you have those things outlined. These are the things you want to get out of your visit. Then the next thing you want to do is after you've had your discussion with them is what is it that he told you? You had a jot on the bottom of the picture. This is what he told you. And he's ordered these tests or suggested these things. That piece of paper reflects what you did at that visit. Now it's important. Now you got a date, you have a visit, you have a, had a plan about what you're doing. Call it a care plan if you'd like. Now you're gonna go get all these tests done. Hopefully you're gonna listen to what he said and. As long as you guys had conversed, I would suggest that you be reliable in getting those tests because he would have had some reason why he asked you to do it. You're going to get those tests. You're going to either get them as part of your looking it up in your, hopefully, your EMR that your hospital system that you are working in makes available to you so that you can look at your imaging, your blood tests, etc. And you can jot yourself a note. It says CBC, he, he asked you to get a blood count and you make a, a dash line and you say, it's normal, okay? Or he said, chest, 
CAT scan. No ch substantive change since last visit. Or pulmonary function test. Pulmonary function tests seem to improve. Now, hopefully he's called you, told you how to interpret those tests or he's, you've had communication. The way I ask people to do it is I ask them to take that piece of paper and put the results of those tests behind that piece of paper, okay? And they use an on, ongoing list so that when you have your a, a next appointment, you fill out the questions that you are going to go over at your next visit. And you make certain that everything that you wrote and you got from him the last time is still consistent with the communication you had. Now you asked me specifically about the softer findings, the not the blood test results or the imaging about how do you feel, what was going on, et cetera. There are many good apps that are out there that people I have heard use for following their course of their chronic illnesses. I don't have anyone specific, but I'm sure that we've talked about there are some, and maybe you can have one of the ladies uh, post some of the ones that we have looked at. I don't know if most of the people know that at Life and Breath, we are working hard to produce a single tool to make this more usable for you. Kevin had shared a little bit about a symptoms log that he uses on Google Docs and everything. It, it allows him to track his blood work over time, things of that nature. But I think what you just shared is very meaningful because a lot of different people are utilizing and keeping track of their journey in different ways. And one of the things that you mentioned Life and Breath is doing, we're trying to create something that is gonna be meaningful for these patients to be able to utilize you know, to empower them, to be able to, to have these conversations as they engage with their provider. How important is that to be prepared when you go in and talk to your medical professional, you know, and understand more about your journey? Well, it's again, if one is passive about in the treatment of their diseases, really, you should not be, let me, I'll be blunt. Better informed patients get better care. The ones that are engaged in the participation with their providers always do better than the ones that are passive and are not engaged. So there are a lot of ways to do it, but the principal term is engagement. If you can work, if you know, America's got a lot of different healthcare systems in a lot of ways, some are in small towns, some are big towns, some are around universities, et cetera. But if you can participate within a system so that your pulmonary doctor or your internist or your urologist or your whatever it is that you're using for your sarcoid are all part of the same system and share the same electronic medical record, then the doctors can share this information all together. Remember, it's not just the patient who needs to know everything, it's everybody else in that care team. If for me, I, I send a note when I get a lab test, I include the other doctor's name right on the lab test. So it shows up on their inbox. So if I'm ordering a set of blood work and I need it, and I, I make the whole care team that takes care of that person with sarcoid get every lab test result. If they're getting a CAT scan or the pulmonologist orders it, it shows up in my inbox so that I read it and I know what's happening with the patient. This is what we were all hoping would occur with a globalized healthcare, you know, and, and I say globalized because it's not just national. This book that I told you with that piece of paper where you start putting your lab test, if you really want to be able, if you had to travel outside the country or something happened, and you've got sarcoid, you really don't want to be in the dark. You would like to be able to have the results of this type of testing and know how to reach your physicians, how to be able to get the data to be able to share it with others so you get the care you need. You know, it, it's, it's very important. And it seems like tracking your journey is very important also. Sometimes you have flare-ups, you have it at the the wrong time and 
you're in, you, you don't remember. And it's, so it's good to journal things. It's good to keep information and keep, you know, that um, uh, bits and pieces that you can put the picture together. So when you're in front of your medical professional, you guys can communicate. You can kind of keep track of what's going on and what medication worked, what medication didn't work. Tonight, we talked about supplements. We talked about herbal uh, situation. We talked about timing of certain tests, depending on the organ that's affected. We, we did a lot out there and everything. So being able to journal that, um, you know, being able to track your symptoms, you know, and, and understanding that, you know, are your symptoms something that, you know, are debilitating to you or that interfere with your life? And are those uh, situations that are alerts and signals that you should, you know, seek out um, somebody to speak with about the situation. Any, any more thoughts or comments in that realm on the sim symptom front? No, I think it's, it's apps and, you know, it's something obvious, but should be said as well. Your providers need to, who, need to know who your other providers are, who else is providing you care so that you're, it's not just an isolated person. Your pulmonologist better know who your primary care doctor is and the other people treating you, especially if they're not part of a larger system. Um, I think there's one other point to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, the, the idea of being able to know and be able to communicate is fundamental in this disease. You remember, you're not a sarcoid patient, you are a patient with sarcoidosis. You could have, you know, you might have hypertension, diabetes, elevated cholesterol, coronary disease. Remember that not every symptom you're gonna have may be correlated to your sarcoid. It could be other things. So it's really important that the communication to your team is correct. Because not all shortness of breath is sarcoidosis, guys. Sure. You know, it could be cardiac disease. It could be, you could have a, a bad mitral valve where you're now backing up pressure. You could have thrown a blood clot from your legs. Heck, you could have COVID. Do, do, not, do not focus 100% on, I have a sarcoid and everything in my life is going to resolve around sarcoid. You are a patient with sarcoid. You are not just a sarcoid patient. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Really, really good points. Really good points. Um, we do have a, just a couple other questions in closing for this evening. Um, the, the next question was more centered around pregnazone and, you know, when should you take pregnazones? Do, do all patients take pregnazones? No. The answer is no. The majority of people get no treatment unless you see progression or have symptoms. It's a more complex discussion than simply, oh, you're going to take SARC, you're going to take prednisone. You don't want to take prednisone unless you have a reason. Yeah, prednisone is a drug that's not uh, wonderful. It helps if you need it. If it is something to stop progression, et cetera. Prednisone has cuts both ways. It is an immune suppressant. If you are on large doses of steroids for a long time, your immune system is not normal because of it. But yet in the same breath, I'm telling you, I'm gonna give you prednisone if you needed it, right? So just prednisone is not magic. Sure. It's helpful. Well, uh, Dr. Lamus, on behalf of all of the patients that suffer with sarcoidosis, the, the caregivers that support them, um, the Life and Breath Foundation, we are really, really happy and uh, that you were able to join us this evening. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. You have people calling you for emergencies and everything, and you still made time for us this evening and you made time for this community that struggles with this disease. We greatly appreciate you taking time and really being a meaningful um, participant and driver in this. And uh, we need more physicians like you who care 
who want to uh, uh, devote their time in uh, helping patients. And uh, we just are truly, truly humbled by being able to share this evening and the last hour with you. Well, it's my pleasure. And again, if people have questions, send them in. And I, I will return every call to these people. But please just remember, I cannot give you specific things about your disease because I, I really am limited in that I can't provide direct care as though this is a video visit. But I'll be more than glad to talk to you if you have some specific question that we weren't able to answer tonight. Okay. Excellent. So uh, Abigail is my partner in crime. She helps me uh, organize the foundation on a day-to-day -day basis. Abigail, would you be able to share with everybody how they can connect with the Life and Breath Foundation, with Dr. Lamus, how they can um, find us on social media and various platforms that we have available? Um, yes, I've been putting some of the information in the chat. Um, if you'd like to email us at info at lifeandbreath.org, then I can connect with Dr. Lamus and you. Um, our social medias, we have Life and Breath Foundation on Instagram and Facebook, um, and we primarily focus on extending hope um, and just really communicating positivity, as well as updating you on recent studies that have been released, um, and then clips from our various speaker series. And then, of course, all of this information is on lifeandbreath.org, and we keep that updated, and um, as things come along, they'll all be up on the website. So thank you. Abigail, awesome, and we appreciate it. Again, it's important for all of us to share and be ambassadors to help others. If you are connected with other people that are affected with this disease, please connect them with the Life and Breath Foundation. We wanna disseminate this information. We wanna build bridges to help those affected with the disease. It's very important in our passion and our mission statement uh, for the organization. Until the next time, we're happy to bring the speaker series for August. We have an important and surprise visitor that is gonna be coming on and she has an incredible journey that she wants to share with all of you. Please stay tuned. Abigail will put it out there on social media to connect, but put it on your calendar, August the 11th. It's something that you need to be there live, okay? Uh, but this evening, we're gonna let you go. Thank you for joining us live. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to serve those patients that suffer with sarcoidosis. Dr. Lamus, thanks you again. All we'll right. See you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night.